On Christmas Day, I shared a quote from Father Chad Ripperder on how the demons are doing very well in convincing the people that having children is a bad thing. Having children aren't good, and if we must, one or two is enough. And so I thought I'll share this with you from The Exorcist to start this video. And judging by how many people were triggered in the past, whenever I share stuff like this from Father Ripperger, a lot of people will disagree and go on a full-blown criticisms of the man. But I hope we can all try and listen with an open heart. The advice and lessons here from this holy man. Marriage is for the sake of children. This means that if one enters marriage without being ready to have children, you see this all the time. Oh, we want to get married, but we're not ready to have children. Well, then you're not ready to get married. The very nature of marriage is ordered towards children. And so this is something which people tend to think that, oh, well, we'll just use NFP for the first couple of years. And then once we kind of get comfortable around each other and we're settled a little bit more and we get to a certain place financially, we'll have children. Well, then you're not ready to get married at all yet. And part of this is just an immaturity on people's parts. You're just not mature. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, bless it. Hi. Thanks for tuning in to Armor of God. As always, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you for your time and wishing all of you a Merry Christmas. Anyway, I'm sure by now, at least for those of you who have been part of the community here for almost a year now, know that I love reading and finding out stuff about the late Father Gabriel Morth. And from what I've learned of this holy man, he was known to be jovial and friendly outside of exorcisms and sometimes joking around during interviews. But during exorcisms is a whole different story. He would be serious, no joking around and completely professional. And so recently, our Catholic brother Rob from the Blue Collar Catholic Channel did an interview with Father Amorth's former assistant, Father Joseph Iannuzzi, who is also a priest that I highly admire, respect, and love. If any of you'd like to watch the whole interview between Rob and Father Iannuzzi, there's a link to the interview in the description box below, so please do watch it, and also please subscribe to Blue Collar Catholic Channel as well. I being from New York, you're from, where are you from? Jersey, North. Jersey, right no, neighbors, the, okay. Right across the river. <laughs> right across the river, that's right. I'll try to break it down in the old New York brogue, talk simple appreciate English. <laughs> I appreciate it, Father, I appreciate it. <laughs> you get out of here. <laughs> you talking to me. <laughs> you talking to me? I, I think he's talking to me. <laughs> yeah, forget about it. And now to kick this off, I would like to share an interesting highlight from the interview where Father Iannuzzi talks about his experience helping out Father Amorth during the interview, and as he did so, he also compared Russell Crowe's portrayal of the man in the movie released earlier this year, The Pope's Exorcist. It was, he was more serious than how the film portrayed him. He was lighthearted, yes, but at the right time, and... Um, he wouldn't be shocked during an exorcism as Hollywood portrays him through Russell Crowe. You know, so there's a scene where the person who's infested by demons shocks Russell Crowe with responses, but that was not the case. Father Amworth was so seasoned that nothing shocked him. <laughs> yeah, he's seen it all, and he took me to several real possession cases, even of a nun who was possessed. She turned herself over to the devil. Professed female religious becomes possessed by Satan, but it does happen. She abandoned her vows and turned her life around in the wrong direction, but through repeated exorcisms with her, um, she eventually came around. Uh, Father Amworth uh, was very grounded, very practical, and very humble. He used, whenever I did exorcisms with him, other people, and you don't see that in the film. And it's actually not prudent to do an exorcism alone unless it's you know, an unusual case or where you have no other opportunity, as in the gospel with Christ. Of course, he was God. He didn't need assistance. But Father Amoth, in his humility, knew he didn't have all the gifts. So he would avail himself of the expertise of those who did, for example, those who were able to discern the spirits. He would allow them to join in, be them both male and female. And I would assist with another priest and two other women actually that was normally his team at the time sometimes it was two other priests not only for the discernment or charismatic gifts that they possessed that he did not he had them but he didn't have them heightened in every respect as others did as in certain fields that others did but also they were there because the Possessed, the afflicted would get violent, and he himself, in his advanced age, couldn't con contain them. 
the individuals. So he would have each of us like hold on to an arm or leg, things like that. Because once he placed the stole around their neck or on their forehead or against their throat where the demons collect, and then they would become very violent. They were um, spiritually allergic and repulsed by anything sacred. And he knew that. And that's exactly why he used those elements to draw them out, to provoke them. Because one thing Satan cannot do is cloak himself with the veil of obedience. He can appear to be a saint, or as St. Paul says, an angel of light, and deceive the, the masses. But what he cannot do is obey. Father Amorth would put him under obedience in Jesus' name to reveal themselves, these demons and the devil himself. And um, uh, he would um, become very serious at the moment of the exorcism. There was no joking then at all. But beforehand, he would be very humble and very jovial so that he would let you be yourself and show your true colors. That's exactly what he wanted you to do. And most of the people that he would play over were not truly possessed because possession is a rarity. But those that were would not come of their own initiative. Either their spouse would take them or he would go where they were, as was portrayed in the film. He would go into a person's flat apartment and there'd be the family there. And the, the devil hates light, even literally. So these people mm. will be in a dark room. And for the second half of this highlight is something that is often brought up in the comment sections here, where some people will go on saying something like this. Any Christian can cast out demons. Any Christian can perform exorcisms. You don't need a priest to cast out demons. You don't need a priest to perform exorcisms. I'm sure some of you have noticed this as well. So here you go, Father Yanuzi provides the answer to those of you who might probably be wondering about this too. I asked him to describe the difference and I got an understanding, but I want to get your point. What is the difference between a layman uh, in the name of Jesus uh, delivering someone from evil spirits and, a, and an exorcist priest with the authority of his bishop to go and actually do right. a full exorcism? Well, the first answer, it's twofold, is canon law. Church always follows canon law, and canon law does not allow any layperson to perform a major exorcism. That's the key ad adjective. Anyone can perform a minor exorcism, but not a major exorcism. Only a cleric appointed delegated by his bishop can perform a major exorcism. Um, minor exorcisms that anyone can perform, including lay people, are the St. Michael prayer, the last words of the Our Father prayer, or other prayers that you may find composed by Father Amoth at the end of some of his books that are in Latin as well as translated into English, and they're very effective. And when it comes to an exorcism on and expelling, whether it be a cleric or a lay, the second part of the answer is not just canon law, it's also the holiness of life of the individual performing that deliverance. So if we are talking about lay people doing exorcisms, I suppose it's more acceptable to call it a deliverance than an exorcism because it's kind of confusing when you say a lay person does an exorcism. Though technically it's correct <clears throat> if it's understood as not a major but a minor exorcism. And when it comes to deliverances, um, we all have the authority in the name of Jesus Christ to cast out demons, but not in our name, but in the name of Christ. And holiness of life is very powerful. Let me recall to you the act that occurred in the Acts of the Apostles, ostensibly written by Luke, who wrote more than anyone in the New Testament, including the Gospel and the Acts. There was an episode where a man tried to free this person from demonic possession, and he was attacked. And the demon said to him, Jesus I know and Paul I acknowledge, but who are you? <laughs> that holiness enables that person to do that. I'd say, oh, I don't know, a couple of hundred exorcisms with him, maybe more. I was I participated over several years with him in exorcisms. First as a seminarian, after having read his book, I've experienced pretty much what you see in Hollywood. <laughs> Things wow. move by themselves. Bodies do levitate. Um, wow. Cabinets open their doors by themselves without any wind or without any imbalance on the floor, gravity moving it. Um, voices uh, change and the language changes. Prophecies are given to this individual as well as hysterical strength. Um, and uh, they can reveal things about you personally. But here's the catch. Satan is a liar. 
So if he's in the if you're in the presence of others doing an exorcism, and the demons try to talk to this or that person about their life, he he will never tell the truth all the time. He will mix the truth with falsehood. It's sort of like the apocryphal books. You don't know which is true and which is false. <laughs> so that's why you don't listen to him at all. And this is right. And this is one of the dangerous things of an untrained lay exorcist. Father Amorth would never allow the lay people to directly communicate with the possessed. Never. Only the priest does that. That was a very strict rule of his. And I abide by that same standard because I realize that it's dangerous for a lay person to one-on-one -on -one go against the devil. Holiness of life is extremely important here. But let us not forget, it's not just holiness of life. It's the powers of the anointing that the lay don't possess. I'm not saying the lay cannot perform a deliverance. They can, but it's the major exorcism they cannot. And during the major exorcism, Father Ramoth, only, uh, only he would communicate with the possessed. Um, number one, because the anointing that he possesses, the lay do not have. And number two, the training and theology that the priests have, the lay as a rule do not have. Um, so... I've experienced quite a few things, thanks to uh, Father Amroth inviting anyone to participate in these. In his book, the first one that came out that I read in Italian, it stated he invites lay people, lay people, set, no, no, I'm sorry, he didn't invite lay people. He invited seminarians and priests to join in the exorcisms. And I was a seminarian, so I did join in with permission of my superior general. I wouldn't have gone if my superior said no. He said yes. Yeah. So I went, and that's how it all began. For the next part of this video is actually a continuation of the clip of Father Ripper here at the start of the video. In fact, he's actually answering the question some might have, or who's wondering why demons are trying to stop married couples from having kids. What's in it for them? And the answer to this question will surprise some people, I think. One of the things that the demons have done phenomenally well at is convincing people that children are in fact evil and not good. They're not good, right? Why would you get married and have children, right? Or if you have one, you have one or two because you kind of want to fulfill that satisfaction, but don't have a lot of them, right? They're not good. This is why we have abortion. The contraception is a, basically a sign of children aren't good. And so the, you'll actually see this. Which is kind of the height of irony, by the way. And one of the attacks that people, the demons do on people who have a large family is You'll go into the grocery store, for example, because I've heard this example over and over again, and the people will see, how many kids do you have? Oh, we have seven. Seven? Can't you control yourself? <laughs> it's a good thing I'm not standing there. I would just say, are you and your wife on contraception? Yes. Well, you're on contraception, so you don't have to control yourself. That's the whole point, isn't it? It's the inversion, right? Demons constantly invert everything. But the point I'm getting at is, is that the demons will make children are a burden, a bit of a burden, but there's also a joy that people have in them. And that means that if parents are willing to sacrifice for their children, that's where the whole selfishness thing comes in. The selfishness in relationship to men not willing to deny themselves and be the head of their household, but it's also the selfishness of women in relationship to the curse of Eve and how it's playing itself out in the feminist movement. That selfishness is driving people, the only time they ever have children, is when, it's, when they want the child for themselves rather than it just being a sacrifice because they want to have a large family. Parents are called to sacrifice for their children and for each other. That means you don't get what you want in marriage. You don't. People have this idea that, oh, I can't wait to get married because we're just going to be so lovely living together. Yeah. The fact is, and by the way, marriage is a beautiful institution. It's a magnificent thing when it's lived properly. But a lot of times people don't live it properly. This means that if you enter into marriage without being ready to have children, and you're not willing to sacrifice from day one, then you are not entering into marriage with the right spirit, and the demons are going to use that against your marriage. They're watching you. They're seeing what your motivations are, and they're using them. They're going to use them against them. This is one of the reasons why there's a certain kind of doctrine called providentialism, which is basically what? Just let God determine when you have children. Most of the time, in fact, in the entire time I've been a priest, 21 years, there's only twice I've told people, you need to go on NFP. One of them was because of the fact that the, the, the mother had this grave health condition, and they were trying to get it under control. The other one was 
the woman was literally ready to put in a rubber room. And that's why Pius the Eleventh mentions for psycholo- grave psychological causes they can use NFP. She was literally, they had six kids in six years and she was like losing her mind. And because she, you know, and basically I just said, look, you're going to have to s- slow down a little bit until, this, until she can kind of get on her feet. Okay. But providentialism is letting God determine it. The demons, because God said, go, f- go forth, be fruitful and multiply. Why do the demons attack that? One, because every child is in the image of God, which they hate. Second, every child that's born and is baptized eventually is going to take the place of one of the demons. Because when the, the, the God created the hierarchy of nature, of the angels, and their state of grace was directly proportionate to their nature. And when they fell, they left gaps in that. And so the theology is, theological speculation is, that God created man to fill that gap. And so the demons are going to try and make sure every child is killed or never gets baptized in order to make sure that he doesn't get that part that might have been his or what have you. And so this is one of the reasons why demons are constantly attacking the fruitfulness of the marriage. The fruitfulness of the marriage. It's their first attack. And how do they attack the fruitfulness? By dividing the couple psychologically. That's how they end up doing it. You see this all the time, is is that people's conjugal life very often takes a beating because psychologically they're completely divided. And that's a very common thing. The demons have won in a certain sense because there's not as many children. There's not as many, um, there's not as much joy in the marriage, etc. Okay. I shared this on my community post before, but I thought as this is Christmas, it's a good idea to share this in this video as well. When you visit a priest, please remember this that a priest isn't married, nor will he have a family of his own. No wife, no children. His family is his parishioners. He is a spiritual father in faith to the community he serves. His future is in celebrating the Eucharist at Mass every day, listening to confessions, anointing the sick, serving those who come to him for help. A priest may serve a parish only for a minimum of five to seven years. After that, he may be transferred to another parish or assigned a different role in the church. He relies on his team of volunteers, staff, and the lay faithful. Don't expect him to be there all the time for you. When you give money to the church, you may be surprised to know that the money isn't for him because no priest earns a fixed salary. They receive a stipend to meet their basic expenses of food, clothing, and travel. They save every penny to go for a vacation, and much of the money is gifted by friends, relatives, and well-wishers as they don't get paid leave like the rest of us who work. While we work for a fixed amount of hours with two days off a week, priests are expected to be on standby 24-7. So don't be angry if they don't respond to you when you need them. They are humans as well with the same frailty as us. If you hear anyone speaking badly about a particular priest, please correct that person and don't engage in idle gossip without knowing the facts. Remember that they are alone and at times would need company. Pay attention to their emotional, physical, and mental needs. Accompany them if needed or offer a helping hand or even a lift. It's not easy to go out alone at 2 or 3 in the morning, especially in dangerous neighborhoods for counseling or even anointing someone on their deathbed. If someone comes to them at such an hour for help, they have to get up from their deep sleep and still be expected to celebrate Mass in the morning. Who is there for them when they are ill or have emergencies in the middle of the night? Yet they are required to perform their duties because if not them, who? Remember their birthdays, ordination anniversaries, and important events in their lives. Celebrate with them, cry with them. Offer a shoulder to lean on. If they fall, don't judge or criticize. Lift them up and help them on their journey in life. Don't be offended if they don't live up to your expectations. No priest is perfect. So take care of your priests. Remember the ones who baptized, confirmed, married, and anointed you. The ones who offer masses for your intentions and pray for you. Some of you commented that I am supposedly suppressing free speech whenever I remove comments that are criticizing the priests that I featured in the videos before. And I have to be honest here, whether it's Father Ripperger, Father Yanusi, Father Carlos Martins, Father Lampert, and so many other... You can criticize me all you want, but I would not hesitate to defend these priests and will do my best in my role as the admin of this channel to encourage healthy discussion without any name calling such as something like these priests are apparently lunatics, heretics, and so on. Or anyone who is insulting Pope Francis, spreading false claims about what the Pope supposedly said when he didn't. I will not hesitate to remove those comments as well. For example, when people are copy and paste comments saying Pope Francis allows the blessings of same-sex union which is false, and I can dedicate a whole video refuting this false claims, but my brother Rob on the Blue Collar Catholic channel is already doing a great job doing it. 
so that's why I didn't release any video regarding that matter. I'm sure there are a lot more YouTube channels out there where insulting one another is the norm, but I'm not looking to be the most popular channel out there and instead, my intention is for us to learn together from these holy priests, and as I've said many times before, I'm always being extra careful to which priests I decided to feature in the videos. So if you disagree and somehow hate whatever these priests are sharing through their interviews, podcasts, and lectures, just throw your insults at me instead of them. But if it's possible, try to avoid insulting one another in the comments. That's what I hope for in this coming year, 2024. Well then, that is all for the video this time. Again, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us amidst the Christmas celebration. But as always, I hope all of you have learned a lot from this video. And I'm so sorry if I can't reply to every comment as fast as I used to, but I am trying to dedicate a couple of hours every day to reply to as many comments as I can, especially from the people who are always here every time there's a new video and have been supportive of this channel throughout the year. But also equally important, responding to comments that are spreading false claims about our faith, planting seeds of confusion. These are the type of comments that I will definitely respond to, and I'll continue to share interesting lessons or fun fact about our faith on the community post. Anyway, for those of you who'd like to support our works, I left a link to our PayPal donation in the description box below, and from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for your continuous support, contribution, and prayer. And to those of you who have emailed me, or commented saying you'd like to help but couldn't afford it. Please don't feel bad about it. I'm grateful and thankful that you're here with us and learning together. And until the next time, thank you so much. May God bless all of you and Merry Christmas.